Hello, and welcome to Clamp, the creating, living, and making podcast. I'm your host, the Grand Alexander, and I'm joined today with Adam Mackey from Maker Mackey. Hello. And Morley Kurt from Morley Kurt. That's me. Hey. <laughs> Formerly known as Yell Rom Blog. Uh, yeah, so uh, what's in your uh, clamps this week, Adam? So I um, I did a bit of, bit of shopping this week. I bought a new laptop and, and camera and accessories. So pretty excited. I think this week coming, I'm going to be recording the last video on my phone and editing on my iPad, which is like really exciting for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, so, so are you going to be gonna doing be all your editing on the change. PC from now on? Yeah, yeah. Which I think is going to make like n- not just life so much easier, but like I'll be able to do some like more features and stuff that I couldn't really do with the iPad and that and all that sort of stuff. Like sure. so, the program I'm looking at using has like all the effects and everything built into it, so like you don't have to make something in one program, transfer it to the other program, and all that. So that sounds awesome. Is yeah. it, you got a laptop then? Yeah, so I got a. Um, if anyone wants to hear about it, I'll talk about like more specifically what I bought in the after show, which you can find on our Patreon. But um, yeah, so I got a I got a gaming laptop. I got a camera. I got a wide angle lens for the camera, um, and some more stuff. But yeah, I'm excited to have like a wide angle lens where I can actually record like a, an area without it. Like if I have to record up close, it's really hard to like actually get stuff in frame with the with the um phone so yeah that is it's it's so exciting like the fact that you got a new pc and camera at the same time i'm I'm like really excited for you because like yeah Yeah, when i got my new camera at the beginning of this year it's just like your world gets blown open yeah well it's it's i kind of like i was like well what's the point in buying a new laptop without buying like if i buy a new laptop i can already edit the phone footage on the ipad without the laptop so there's no point in that and then if i get a camera i have no way to edit it because the ipad won't be strong enough mm. so I, was like, I had to get both or not like i just couldn't justify buying one you you I, justified I it nicely just right there yeah. i'm sure you're <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and um and the other thing I've been working on this week is the well yesterday for everyone listening but this morning I put out a new video well this morning for you guys it was last night for me <laughs> um so something I, I've always had this dream where I wanted to make like I don't know how to explain it but like sort of like a school for like under ten year olds for like woodworking mm-hmm. oh cool so you'd have like like say six kids in a class would come in and you'd teach them like they would make something just to sort of like get kids into the whole maker community and, and all sort of stuff, especially for kids that like grow up without dads and all that sort of stuff. And then I realized that like I can do that with videos. So yeah, so I brought out this new series called Woolworking for Kids with my son. So I don't know how often, maybe like once a month or something, we're going to put out a video of actually making something together. And I think it's really interesting to see like how much a four-year-old can do. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like in the video we did, um, the way I did it was I, I cut all the pieces for a birdhouse, and then I pre-drilled holes for the nails just to make it easier for him to put them in, and then like he hammered it all together. But we had an issue where like the hammer that I, I only had my hammer, which is like really heavy for him. So we went out yesterday and bought a toolkit for like a kid's toolkit, which is cool. So it's like the hammer is like a lot lighter and all that sort of stuff. So interesting how that goes i'm thinking of maybe um getting him on the scroll saw next episode like with assistance obviously but we'll see how that goes i love that that's awesome i think that is like a ton of potential you showed a lot of trust in your son i'm gonna say i'm gonna tell you that (laughs) i will say i didn't put it in the video but he hit my thumb once (laughs) (laughs) yeah so here in uh, north america home depot does little courses that's very similar to what you're doing and uh yeah. but obviously they're location specific on whether or not they do it the the one near my house i haven't seen them put them on uh so i think this is really cool and that you you're putting out the plans i saw so that yeah. people could build along with you which is kind of cool yeah i'm still trying to decide whether i want to put them out for free or charge 
for them. I mean, if I charge, it'd be like a dollar for the plans. But then I kind of think like, I don't really want like, I don't really want to charge because like it's more of I want to the whole reason of doing this is to get kids into it. So like why put a paywall on that? Yeah. yeah. I, I think doing it for free makes sense because of, of that reason and and it'll also help drive traffic if it catches on, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then one day you yeah. might get monetized and boom. Yeah. Well I think one of the hardest things with like wanting to start that business and stuff was like I myself, like I like my son's four, it's my like my first son, so I don't have like I've never had a kid that age before. Is that like you don't know what they can do, hmm. you know? Like I want to put my son on the scroll saw, but I'm gonna buy one of those blades that's like cuts in any direction just to make it a bit easier for him. Hmm. But like I'm gonna do it with supervision and stuff. Like I wouldn't just leave him to do it, but I don't know. Like I don't know if he's too young for that. Like I won't know until I try it. So I think it'd be good for like to have these videos out there where people can go, oh well. His four-year-old can do it. Maybe mine can too. You know, like give people sort of a bit of a idea of what kids can do. And I think if you communicate that uh, you are trying this out for the first time, like people yeah. will really like that because those like, I, as the sole non-parent here, I'm always like amazed. Like if you're a parent, <laughs> you have to do everything for the first time. Like no one has yeah. any experience being a parent. Um, <laughs> yeah, and everything gets easier with the second too. Because because the, the second the second kid watches the first kid, it's like I want to do that too. Then they try and learn earlier and stuff. And, gotcha. and that, but yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Is that is so? That was- you you already put out the first video, or it's coming out soon? I put it out like twelve hours ago. Okay, cool. I yeah. clearly not been on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I I only started watching it just before the uh, got onto the chat here, but so I yeah. I saw the trust that you had in your son not hitting your thumb, and I went, "Ooh, I don't know." He did really good. <laughs> yeah, it was looking like he was doing good. Yeah, he had issues with the hammer, so like I'm actually in a lot of it, holding the end of the hammer and helping him aim it. Um, which my wife's like, "You did everything. You just held the hammer." I'm like, "Well," and he explained it to her like. You know, it, it's hard. It was hard for him to do, but now he's got his own toolkit. We went out and bought one. I think um, he's like so excited. He's like, Dad, are we going to make something today? He's going to annoy me like every day. I know it, which is good. <laughs> that's what I want. Like I yeah, want my awesome. son to be into it. But yeah, he wants to make a um, – I said, what do you want to make next? He goes, oh, I want to make a dinosaur. And I said, what, like a dinosaur money box? And I and then I remembered um, – Dimitri, XYZ uh, Create – xyz creations made yeah. one and i was like that's like perfect like for a scroll saw but i don't want to just copy his idea so i was thinking of messaging him and see what he thinks but yeah, yeah he's got it up on instructables you can check out the license that he gave it as well uh, yeah but he put it up on instructables for people to make not people to make a video on what well here's here's an idea so if, if your son just wants my pretty community. if your son just wants a dinosaur it might be kind of fun if like this is just just spitballing, but like if you just took a bunch of scrap wood and like nailed it together, and you made like articulating limbs, so it could kind of like like a little action figure like walk around, <laughs> yeah, just like cool. super simple. But he'd probably love it. Yeah, you well, could- and that's the thing. Like a four year old like needs that simple stuff. You know, like he he's not going to be able to cut pieces to precise precision and and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, you could also get him yeah. to draw his own dinosaur and then transfer that to a piece of wood, and he cuts it out. Yeah. Could yeah, too, I mean, yeah, he might be too young for that. I don't. My son's two, and his drawings are mainly scribble. Yeah, so. say, say, say with mine, but he he does um he does a good person. Oh, Actually, okay. he did this for our for our viewers at home. Uh, that's nice. We'll uh, take a picture of that and put it on the Patreon. Yeah, well, nice. So, uh, right. how, how about you, Morley? What have you been up to this week? So I've been doing a bunch of different things. Um, I've been working on a new wallet design, which is kind of really an older idea that um, I was doing a wallet commission for a friend. And this was one of the things I threw out or like an idea I threw out at him. Uh, he wasn't super into it. So we ended up going with something else. But um, now that I have the 3D printer, I realized that it's a really interesting opportunity um, to to make it in, in a way that I didn't really expect before. Um, I know I'm kind of teasing because I'm going to make a video out of it, but I'm pretty excited about it. I think it, I think it will turn out very cool. Um, yeah, 
So just stay tuned for that. Um, I've also been editing the enclosure video as I have been the past couple weeks. Um, been doing a lot of voiceover today and that is coming out very nicely. Um, yeah. yeah, it's one of those it's one of those projects that like I'm trying to give it all the time that it deserves because there's a lot that went into it and I want to come out with something nice. But now I feel like I'm in a good, good rut to kind of just ride and got my workflow down, got a nice, I did a, I did a big rough edit before, like all the way through. And now I'm kind of cutting it down as I record the voiceover and like add notes for B-roll to then add on later. So it feels like a pretty good process. And I know a couple of weeks ago I was talking about it being a little intimidating, but now I feel like I feel like I have it right under my belt. Yeah, I definitely I feel like a rough edit really helps with that. I find it really as long as you don't end up cutting something out that you forgot that you had filmed, because I'll I'll often do that. Like I'll try and film like a fun special effect and then forget about it by the time I'm doing my rough edit, and that ends up on the editing room floor because I just went like slash yeah. through everything and yeah. Well, I feel, I mean, it's a, it's a big ish project, but I, I have a good enough mental catalog that like, I'm confident enough that all nothing will be really forgotten. And sometimes like I start second guessing myself, like, Oh, I had this great idea. Like got to make sure it's all documented. So I don't forget it. But like, I just feel like I need to trust myself and know that like, I know this project backwards and forwards and, uh, nothing hopefully will be left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> nothing that doesn't should, that shouldn't. Uh, I'm, um, I'm excited for that. Like I don't do rough edits. Because like it's, it's a massive pain, so I'm excited to try like all that sort of. Yeah, sort of I think I feel like well. it's kind of necessary once a project reaches a certain scale, just so you, f- yeah. at least for like my psyche, just so I feel like I have a grasp on it and I know yeah. how much I'm working with, and and then like that can kind of inform where how I feel the pace of the end of the video can kind of inform the pace of the beginning, and I yeah, I don't, it just makes it a little a little easier. Yeah, I, I also like it to to figure out song lengths. Because like, yeah. you want to try and have your song transitions at particular points that make sense with a change in tempo of the video or a, like a particular thing is done. Like you built the carcass of this 3D in- printer enclosure. Okay, well, mm-hmm. that's, you know, one thing. And then you're on to another. Like you want something to have been done and then a new thing. And I find when I do a rough edit it makes it a lot easier to find those spots. And, yeah. And, and like, I, I, I'm kind of cheating it on this one where like, I'm just forcing the songs to cut where I want them to. Like, I'm not waiting for the end. And I, I've, I've noticed more people do that pretty often in videos. And I was going to say, nothing, I, nothing I, is I, sacred. Um, there's a, there's a channel I started watching a while ago and um, he does that. Like he'll, he'll have video like a time lapse go. And then he just cuts the video uh, the song exactly where he starts talking and then goes to like the vlog part. Mm-hmm. And I started doing that as well. Like instead of fading it out, I just, just cut the feel, cut the song. And yeah. And I, think I actually to, really like it. I think you have to be a little intentional about it. Like I, I try to beat match yeah. and uh, like cut on the downbeat and kind of like, if I'm cutting a song and then starting another one, I'll try to like, like in my head, like one, two, three, four, and then start on the next downbeat um, or just try to match up the base it just it makes it feel not so j- start jarring but the nice thing about youtube is that people kind of expect those sort of yeah jumpier cuts that i get way too much anxiety about trying to put two songs together <laughs> like i always try and find a way that like stops the song and then like there's no music for like a minute because i'm talking or something and then put the next song in yeah. i hate trying to like put two songs like right up to each other <laughs> See, and that's where i i use like a fade to black at that time so the song fades out, my thing yeah. finishes, I fade to black, I come back with a new song, it makes sense. But I totally yeah. get where you're coming from. If, that's, if that doesn't line up with whatever you're doing, it makes it way harder. Yeah, and I think there's there's other tricks you can use as well. Like in this one, I'm, there's some parts of the project that are just so starkly different that I can't just transition the video. So I'm going to do some talking head stuff. And then you can kind of like lower the volume of music and then change it and people don't even notice that the song has changed while the volume was lowered. Um, Some talking head stuff, hey? Yeah. Um, I know someone else that just did that. Grant? Jeez, you don't watch any of my videos. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I feel like you do talking heads pretty, pretty often. No, 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 no. 
I literally had a floating head throughout my entire oh, video. Okay. <laughs> oh, I have not I, seen that. I no. green screened just my head. Oh, we, that, okay. I, I gotta see that. Yeah. Anyways, just to round out what I've been working on, um, this was this was wasn't last week, but just today I put out the video on making a patch for Grant, uh, his dog Rivet, that is now situated on his pack so i was very happy with how that came out that was fun that was awesome thank you thank you man it was so rivet has an adorable mini schnauzer that i put onto a leather patch and i was reading in the notes and i'm like what's a rivet patch (laughs) yeah (laughs) understandable i uh uh, just say you put that video out today it's on instagram it's just like a one minute right and it's got a teaser from something that i did this week yeah. But to continue, what else did you do, Morley? Um, I also went camping this week, but we will talk about that more later. Mm-hmm. Uh, Grant, what have you been up to? Well, um, I uh, I put out my uh, poster holder uh, video, this giant poster holder, which is, uh, it, it started off strong, like a super strong video, and, and I was super happy because I did not expect, like, it's not like... I don't know. It's not something like it's pretty simple design, so I expected to 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 get the lower view count, but it came out pretty strong, so I was happy about that. Um, I uh, I disabled the service host sys main in Windows, so my laptop couldn't do like video editing basically at all. I had to put it at like you know pixelated to the max, and it was constantly like chugging along. And if I wanted to check and edit, it was just chug 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 and i started i was just like i almost like gave up and threw the laptop out the window uh, (laughs) because it was getting so bad so i like googled how to like fix i would just went and looked at everything taking up resources on my system and there's the thing called service host syst main anyways if you disable that it makes your laptop run way faster so, anyways, <laughs> but at what cost? What are you shutting down that unknowingly? So, un- it's not unknowingly. I looked into what it was. It's basically okay. a. Uh, it it's prioritized. It runs in the background to try and prioritize what it thinks you are going to pick next. And what oh. happens is it like it gets overwhelmed the longer you've owned your computer, and not like done a. a a refresh of whatever they formatting and, and rebooting all your windows stuff. So basically it just gets to a point where it's like overloaded and doesn't know what to do. So disabling it makes it so your computer runs a little less efficiently than it would if it was brand new, but gotcha. more efficiently but it, if, it, if it's, if it's broken and constantly using up too much memory. All right, cool. Yeah, that's why I went to an iPad because my my computer was the same. Like yeah. every time you try, even not even trying to watch the edit, just like trying to render it at all. Well, no, not even render. Like try and you yeah, add any special effects, and like the computer would just crash. Like yep. it was just whole computer was just yeah. That's exactly what was happening, and I was like, I'm not. I'm adding a transition, like a fade to black, and it was like. Ah. I, you're gonna crash whoa, the computer. Man. <laughs> yeah, whoa, yeah. Relax. <laughs> so uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, another thing is, I I got a canoe uh, from my father. Uh, he got it about forty years ago, um, and he hasn't used it in the last four years. So I asked him if I could have it, and he said yes. Um, so he brought that up, and that's awesome because I'm gonna finally be able to get out in the water. Um, and it came with the the paddles that he also bought forty years ago. So I've uh, been fixing them up. I, one of them was broken, so I've added a new piece onto it, and I'm sending them down, take off the old finish, and put on new finish on them. Nice. Because they were pretty uh, bad, and I think I'm going to add in some wood burning, kind of add in a little uh, family thing on the paddle. Uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do yet, but I'll maybe post that on Instagram, depending on if my last name's in it or not. Because um, <laughs> if it is, then I'm not going to post it on Instagram. Uh, anyways, Blur it in. yeah, you mean Alexander, oh. right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, so the uh, the the other thing I got up to is I I also went camping and I went uh, I went backpack camping 
which is a little different than what Morley did. Uh, and I think that's something we're going to talk about, how camping and making and potentially, you know, living and creating all go in together yeah. when you're camping. So we're going to talk about clamp without an L, which is just camp. Genius. Oh, I was waiting for <laughs> pronoun bump ching. Uh, <laughs> so... Yeah, I went. Uh, I went backpack camping, which meant I I went into the woods all by myself. I've been talking about this for a while, so you guys all know about it. But I uh, I was planning on bringing my dog, but the the heat was like it was thirty thirty four degrees one of the days. It felt like forty, and I just knew my dog wouldn't be able to do it. He's uh, he's eight, um, and he just doesn't like the heat. So uh, it was just me by myself with forty pounds of stuff strapped to my back uh yeah but uh hmm. how about you morley let's, yeah, let's see what of, you did i had a bit of a different experience so i went to algonquin which is about three hours northwest of on uh toronto it's an ontario provincial park and um we did two nights of canoe camping which is actually something i had never done before um so essentially, like I'd gone camping as a kid, but the way you, you canoe camp, which I learned, is uh, is the canoe your tent? Yeah, the canoe is the tent. <laughs> no, so we uh, basically like parked at an outfitter where we rented canoes. So it was Eden and I, and then another set of friends, and um, get all your camping stuff in the canoe. And there's all these interconnected lakes um, that have primitive campsites on them. So you kind of you reserve an area for a night, and then it's basically first come first serve. You camp somewhere around there. And it was awesome. Like it was, it's probably my new favorite way to camp. Um, it just makes it feel like such an adventure because you feel like Lewis and Clark, right? You're like, um, you're going on an, an adventure through these little river systems and portaging, which is taking the canoe out of the river and walking it a couple hundred meters uh, over land to get to the next lake. Um and then you eventually circle back around and come back where you started. And like I've I've camped kind of my whole life in in various formats. And this is yeah, it's probably my favorite. We fished, we ate some of the fish we caught. Oh, um, yeah, that's so much better than what happened to me. I caught, I so I wanted to like I obviously filmed my trip um, in hopes that I'd make a video out of it. And I uh, I just like got a new fishing rod just for the trip that folds up nicely. Uh, and I wanted to test it out before I started filming, make sure everything worked. First cast, caught a fish. Right? Nice. Nice. Yes. I was like, awesome. This is going to be great. It was a sunfish, but whatever. First, like, it literally hit the water and it was gone. It was on. I was like, awesome. Caught a fish. Okay. I did not catch another fish the entire time at all. I spent yeah. hours fishing. That's, that's, that's pretty fishing. common, though. It's like if you have the right lure and you put it in, like they're going to go for it and then they're a little scared away. What's Adam showing us? I don't know. Adam tries to show us stuff. On oh, the- look at the Discord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah, was sorry. trying to be discreet. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm a, th- I'm a talker, talker thinker out loud. Yeah, plus a little like Bilbo just, Baggins going on okay. an adventure. Well, I might as well just say. No, no, no. Um, can you guys hear the helicopter outside? No. no. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. I don't see. I don't even see that message in Discord. So, Are that, is the Australian Secret Service after you? Australian Probably. Secret. Gotcha. Yeah, so five eyes. Five eyes. Do you, yeah. Do you five eyes. Top secret cleared. I am. Oh yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, it's funny. Like I, so we actually ate a smallmouth bass, and I grew up near a pond and. There were smallmouth bass in that lake. And I always thought that like smallmouth bass weren't very good to eat. But I guess like a lot of fish, it kind of just depends where they live because this one was delicious. It was so good. Like no fishy taste at all. Uh, we just kind of roasted it over the fire on a grill. Wow. Um, no no yeah, fish we were, batter? Nope. Just like some salt and pepper. Nice. It was delicious. Yeah. We were, we were kind of going for trout more. Like we had a fly rods. Um, but yeah, that's what... Uh, that's what came yeah. out. Smallmouth, I think, are nicer than than uh, largemouth bass for eating, but mm. uh, it's harder to get one that's a good size for eating. That's usually yeah. the problem. But I'm uh, very picky when it comes to eating fish. I eat like 
shark and that's it. Well, that's probably not a fish that most people would eat. <laughs> well, no, that it is because it's like here. Well, I don't know if maybe it's not there, but here in Australia, like, so um, I think it, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, so if you go to like a fish and chip shop and you get battered fish, it's usually shark. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is definitely not common in North America. Wow. Really? I think that, well, that's what I was told growing up, unless someone lied to me. I mean, I think, I I totally would think you're right because, I mean, we live um, on opposite ends of the world. No, I that's (laughs) totally, you need to look that up. You need to, (laughs) because maybe I do. (laughs) You are wrong. It is not shark. It's going to be like haddock or cod or something like that. It's not going to be shark. Shark is way too hard to catch in the quantities Um, required for, like, you're talking like drop bear. It's also drop bear. It's either shark or drop bear. Like, come on, man. Grant, you're, Grant, you're talking pretty big. You're telling Adam he's wrong about his neck of the woods. Yeah, because I just know Adam. That's. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to look it up right now and verify. But when we're I, about- I am looking it up. Yeah, what we- fish is used in fish and chips in Australia? Uh, most popular Australian caught species sold as fish and chips is flake. There you go. If you buy a flake, you'll be getting a fillet of gummy shark. Thank you. Wow. What? What? <laughs> I knew it was shark. You took a yeah, camera um, and uh... So like I'll eat I'll eat like battered fish from a fish and chip shop and that, but I will like I won't eat brim and stuff like from the no. Uh, it, what if is, it tastes what is like brim? fish, I, I think remember. that's another Australian saying. Uh brim's like our most like popular catching fish. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I don't know. I'm not into fishing, so I just I fished when I was a kid. It's not like a real stuff. shark. Gummy shark? Come on. <laughs> is it a, it's it's not, like a gummy bear? Like, it's like a gummy bear, yeah. Uh, it's a bottom dwelling shark. Anyways. You know, you just you but you said the word shark many times. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah. I you win. This doesn't happen often, you're right. <laughs> Okay, I was wrong. You're right. I was wrong. Okay, it's now recorded forever for, for posterity's sake. I can't believe that. Because when I think of shark, I'm thinking like the the sharks that we get over here, which are way bigger. And they're not. They have teeth. They don't have gums. Okay. They have real teeth. Yeah, I, and they, I don't mean like a great white or something that like is just swimming around the ocean. Well, that's what I like. When you say shark, I don't. Grant, Grant has shark every day. Land shark. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> oh! Uh, anyway, I mean, to get back to <laughs> camping. <laughs> back to the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're recording this. Um, like, I don't know. I actually, so I was telling Grant earlier, I actually wrote, coincidentally, I wrote kind of a blog post about this a few years ago, just how I feel that, like, camping and making do go so hand in hand. Um. I mean, you're building, you're like being resourceful, you're setting things up to be as efficient as possible. Um, and I, I find that it's just like the more I camp and make, like they just, they, they make the other thing better, you know? So I didn't go camping this week, but I plan on going camping like after Christmas because that's our summer. Um, so my point of this conversation is more of the learning aspect. So like, um, learning how to like I know that Grant does a lot of carving and stuff when he goes camping, so I wanted to talk about that. Um, well, and I that. Think so like, do you do you have like a toolkit you take or? So I kind of like it depends on what I want to do, right? If I want to carve a spoon while I'm camping, well, then I take a spoon knife, right? Uh, yeah. If I want to like, but really like a nice. If you want to get into carving, getting like a small little blade uh, is probably and like having a good hatchet is probably all you need. Like I found actually some spalted maple while I was camping. Yep. And if it wasn't 40 degrees Celsius, which is like 104 Fahrenheit for our American uh, listeners, uh, I probably would have done some something. I don't know what I would have done something with it. Instead, I waited till night, burnt it as quickly as possible just so that I could say I had a fire and then went to sleep (laughs) because I was just like zoinked. I did nothing when it came to creating. I, I was literally like done, but, uh, that's, but like on the aspect of like, 
like what I think what Morley was talking about, part of it is like trying to make a fire. Uh, the first fire I, I found some, I found an ash that had fallen. Um, and I, you know, when you see a fallen tree, you expect it to be dry wood, especially like a larger tree. So I, uh, I cut up a bunch of the wood and, uh, like used my, my buck saw and, and my ax and split it all up and it was not dry. And I started a fire and got it and put on this wood and it immediately put the, the fire out. And I was like, <laughs> Oh crap. Like, what am I going to do? I don't like, it's too late now to go find more dry wood. So what do you do? You just keep getting twigs and, and you're like, you're doing a lot of creating and managing and making this fire so that you can try and like, I, my goal was to actually boil water this time using the fire. And mm-hmm. I failed just, I just went, no, I can't do it. It's way too hot. I can't sit by the fire and manage it while it's 40 degrees trying to, I don't know. That was me. But I think that's like the, the Morley part that what he's talking about is blog, uh, out, out on the Morley not yellrumblog.com. Don't go there. But It'll the, redirect there. It's fine. Oh, it doesn't? <laughs> <It's okay>. uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that you, was really great. You make like, a new website. I just bought a new domain and, and then redirected it. Oh, the domain, right. Yeah, because I was yeah. going to say, what, you just, like, didn't you just, like, change the name of the website you had? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, was just I, trying to be, I was just trying to be funny. Um, yeah. You, you know what I feel like? One way that camping is very conducive to making is is kind of like what you just said. It flexes. It's like a workout for those muscles that avoid messing up a project because you're going too fast and not thinking enough. Because when you're camping, and especially if you're kind of back country, if you try to go too fast and like you're not really thinking, like you can really like get yourself into a bit of trouble. Like I don't know, you run out of matches, or like you think uh, you think you have enough water, but you spill it all somewhere. Or you get everything wet. Like that's happened to me before. Like just accidentally get way too wet on a hike and it becomes a downpour. And then all of a sudden you have mild hypothermia and you have to deal with that. <laughs> um, yeah. And something I, I've talked to, I think about to you guys about this before. Like one way that I feel like I've really grown as a maker is in sl- like slowing down when I need to and really taking the time to ponder a decision before I do something that just messes something up and causes more work. And I feel like you're doing that all the time when you're camping. So it's, it's very helpful in that way. Yeah. There's the, the repercussions of a particular, uh, like decision are f- way harder when you're in the back country camping. Like there's one campsite that I stayed at, didn't have access to fresh water. So you'd have to, to get water. It was a 15 minute hike to go to the fresh water spot. Uh, and then you still had to wait 30 minutes after you got there to like purify your water or you'd boil it for a minute and then you got just hot water and that's, you know, no one wants that. (laughs) So, uh, it was like a frustrating experience in a way, but it also like gave you a lot of perspective of how nice it is that your thoughts are like, Oh, I'm going to go to the tap and, turn on the tap and boom, I got water. Like I've always yeah. wanted to have one of these backcountry off grid cabins. And I don't think I realized how much work <laughs> is like involved in that. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever watched my self reliance. Yes. No. Yeah. So that guy's in Ontario and he went out in the woods by himself and built his own cabin. And, uh, just like cut down the trees himself, everything. But it's just like this crazy, like how much work and how much mental like effort he has to put in every day on things that we take for granted. Yeah. And I I mean, one of the great things about camping aside from even making is that it just gives you a change of perspective that you come back to your daily life and you feel like you have a bit of a shifted appreciation for things. Um, like you were just saying, um, I mean, that was, I mean, actually that was kind of one of the reasons we went because we've been so cooped up during COVID and feeling kind of like stuck in the city that we just needed a change of scenery and like a bit of a different living situation for a few days. It's exactly one of like the biggest reason why I booked the camping trip was like, I was just like, I needed to get out. It's like, 
as much as like being alone is like you're you're isolated, but you're isolated there as well. But you're isolated in such a different way. Mm-hmm. That that I have to be. Com- Sorry, I have to be completely honest. I've been camping. I think once in my life. Mm. Um, I mean, I've been camping multiple times, but the the way you guys are. Well, even still. So I went camping when I was like 14 with two of, two of my mates. We got dropped off in like a campsite with a trailer load of stuff that we had hidden like four boxes of wine in. <laughs> um, I don't drink wine at all, but I did that day. Um, box wine is like, great camping because it weighs a lot less than the bottle. So box wine here in Australia is called Goon. Yeah, same here. <laughs> yep. So it's a it's a big thing over here. It's it's like it's cheap and easy to get hammered off and like it's a very popular thing for like sixteen to eighteen year olds. Um hmm. I don't know. It just is. Anyway, so when camping with that, that's probably the only time I've actually properly been camping, although there was toilets there. And then I've been camping with my wife a couple of times, but my wife doesn't like to camp. She likes to it's sort of glamp, but like, like she if she if we go camping and stay in a tent, she wants to stay like in a tent in a caravan park, right? Or like yeah. she wants to be able to go to the tour and have a shower and all that sort of stuff. So like, my wife never just like I I have never gone camping where like I have to source water or source wood for a fire or all that yeah. sort of stuff. But I mean, I don't think the the best parts of camping I don't think are having to like like poop in the woods and find <laughs> water. <laughs> like one of the things that. <laughs> So, like, I went to summer camp, like, every summer from the age of 8 to 16. Um, and it's not like we were – we were in cabins at a summer camp with buildings and things. Yeah. Um, and, like, there were some, there were some like, tent camping among that. But the things – and I, d- I did a bit of, like, tent camping with my family growing up. But then Eden and I started camping when we were in university. Like, we got a tent and we were, like – we kind of rediscovered camping as adults – and kind of, I kind of found that like one of my favorite things was just like having to set up a little home for the night and like yeah. figure out where to put everything. It's just, it's just like very satisfying. And well, it's, it's super uh, satisfying when you pick, like you, you think, okay, if the rain comes, it's going to come this way. And so I should have my tent here, my tarp here. And then it does come and it does what you thought and you don't yeah. end up flooded out because you've thought it out. It's like this super satisfying the the first time you ever set up a camp and you didn't think that out and it rained and you were in the valley of your campsite and then you you wake up in a puddle that's when you realize yeah. oh hey i should like that's a learning experience i think there's a lot of learning when it comes to camping i woke up in a puddle when i was like 12 years old camping with a with a group of kids and i will never I forget say what i was going to say <laughs> i will Last never time. forget it yes, was like I like woke up at 3 a.m., just basically slowly sequestered myself to a smaller and smaller dry patch until I just had to get out of the tent because it was crowded and I was soaked. And I basically just like slept in a chair outside and was cold and miserable. Yeah. And that is a lesson that will stay with me for the rest of my life. (laughs) Exactly. And now you think, where should I put this instead of just, there's a nice flat spot at the bottom of the hill. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Yeah, last last time we went camping, we hired a powered caravan site, set up a tent on it. I don't know even know if you can call this camping, um, and it was sort of like just our hotel. Like we would we would sleep there and then get up and go do like drive somewhere and do something during the day or whatever. But we got a powered site so we could plug a laptop in and watch movies. So it was like I don't That's you wouldn't even nice. call it camping, you know? Like uh, yeah, so, some people I, call that I'm camping. Excited. Yeah, well, I'm excited for for after Christmas because uh, my wife's mum and dad are going to come with us, and her dad's like really like, um, like not rough, but like you know, like he he he's the kind of person that would happily just go out in the middle of a bush with next to nothing and just survive. So I think like he's going to like make the family do that, which I I'm looking forward to because like, you know, if you stay in a caravan park, caravan park, you can't um, you can't really do camping sort of stuff you know like don't need to go find wood or like chop down a tree and carve something and and all sorts it's of also like- it's also really nice to be like away from other people like campsites are are have are nice for their amenities but when you're 
when you know that there's not people for at least like a few hundred feet around. That's so, the- see that, and that's what actually what scares my wife is like she is that there's no one around, and then you hear a noise, and she's like, "Oh my god, someone's coming to kill us!" Like you know, she's that's where the ghost stories come in, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's why camping ghost stories are the best because it feels real. Yeah. So I went to Frontenac Provincial Park, which is for me at like two hours away. Algonquin's only two and a half. I probably should have went to Algonquin, but anyways, I wanted to go to Frontenac because I didn't have a Frontenac uh, patch. They sell patches and I wanted a patch from every single park and I've already got one from Algonquin. Anyways, all that to say is that uh, the, the thing I love about Frontenac is that uh, it's a like you can hike to every one of the the spots. The thing I don't like about it is that they're all clustered, so there's uh, two to four sites uh, at every single spot, and they all share a toilet, but they're all yeah. so close enough that often you can see the people beside you. Yeah, it's, so uh, it kind of right. sucks. So Algonquin's way nicer for the like you're literally the only one on that that spot and you have a thunder box they like to call it which is just a yeah a hole in the ground with a box around it yeah a hole in the ground with a box around it that's right that's yeah. It works. yeah but uh i like for me when i think about camping i love the idea of it and i often like find myself in the moment hating a lot of the aspects of it but when i leave and i'm done i want to do it again so i don't know what that is about me that's type two fun yeah (laughs) i absolutely hate being hot i hate like bugs (laughs) i hate like there's so many things i hate but then i i get out of it and i and i'm done and the first thing i did yesterday is i i was googling and my wife's gonna hear this now but i was googling the uh canoeing from kingston to ottawa down the rideau canal which is like the thing built in the in the early i think early 1900s that delivered like basically barges from kingston to ottawa uh mm-hmm. f- like there are two there were two major cities at the time uh ottawa is now the capital but like i was literally googling that right after finishing a camping trip where i cut it early because of how ridiculously hot it was well it's a, it's, a, it's a source of inspiration right like i'll tell you what like uh, a day into that trip i was thinking about like yeah i want to build a cedar strip canoe these are awesome these are beautiful and they're definitely like i found out that they're lighter than aluminum canoes which is what i used and we talked about this in the pre-show but portaging an aluminum canoe like carrying it over land is while you're wearing a pack is, well you could have uh, done double tripping too. Yeah, but what, no, single trip. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? Uh, I could feel my my spine slowly collapsing. Let's put it that way. How much did that canoe weigh? I don't know. I th- someone said seventy pounds. That probably sounds about right. Yeah. So the this canoe- is um is a bit of a bit of a tangent, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but talking about carrying stuff, um, carrying canoes. I mean, I've recently been rewatching um a TV show that I normally rewatch, like once a year or two years, depending on when I get the urge. Um, have Did you guys ever watch Viva La Bam? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's an episode where, like, they make their own canoes and they got to, like, go down this, like, river in Georgia or wherever it is. And they're, they're having an argument about whether it joins up with, like, the open water. And then it turns out it doesn't. And then the guy that they're having the argument with, which is um, Don Vito, who – passed away a while ago but like he's like a really was a really heavy guy so they got him drunk so he would pass out and then carried his canoe with him in it he weighed like 400 pounds like across the land a whole mile to like the other part of the water that actually joins up with the open water (laughs) and yeah you talking about how heavy the canoe was just yeah it just reminded me of that (laughs) i I know I got the fiberglass canoe from my dad. He said when he bought it, it 40 years ago, it was 60 pounds, which was like amazing for a canoe. And <laughs> I picked it up and put it on my back just for fun. And I was like, I don't think I could see myself walking with a backpack as well. Like it was. Yeah. Does it have a yoke as well? Or is it just like a pole? It just has it? a pole. 
So I'm okay. going to build a yoke for it so that I can Perfect. do it some portaging. But right now it just has a pole. And that was big, a big part of it is that it didn't really fit on my back. And it was kind of made it really awkward. But uh, that's, a so you know, something why, fun. Why are you putting do. eggs on your canoe? Uh well because they <laughs> uh, yeah I actually don't know what you're no, talking so about. A yoke, a yoke is the uh, it's basically so like you imagine a canoe. Like a rudder? No, so imagine a canoe and there's like there's cross braces across it, and the yoke yeah. is kind of like a curved cross brace so that when you flip it upside down, you can put it on your shoulders. Oh, it's right. literally uh, the yoke doesn't it. actually add any structural support. It might it might replace the structural support, but you can get removable ones. Mm-hmm. So specifically for carrying. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because like if you're going on any sort of long range canoe trip, at a certain point you're going to have to take it over uh, a bit of land. Like it's just bound to happen. Wow. Yeah. Why don't you put like retractable wheels on it? That'd be pretty sweet. Because that would add a lot of weight, and some of the places you can't. What? There's no like you couldn't wheels wouldn't work. Just like a hovercraft, maybe. Uh, yeah, you need a hovercraft. <laughs> <laughs> the best vehicle. So I went on a solo adventure and Morley went on a little group adventure. Mm-hmm. And one thing I wanted to like talk about is the, the reason I went on a solo adventure was to kind of test my, my like mental stamina to see if I could handle it. Um, because I thought that would be like going with other people. You can like start relying on other people to do certain tasks. You go by yourself. You're like, that's it. It's you. You're the only one. Mm-hmm. I I tripped and fell. Uh, if I'd hurt myself, I'm the only one, you know? Luckily, the, where I was, there was cell signal. But I know in a lot of Algonquin, there's none. Yeah. So I was just thinking about that before, like with the whole soul service thing. Like, um, I was like, everywhere's trying to get everywhere to have reception for mobile phones. And like, and then it made me think, like, yeah, it's all good and well if you get hurt, you can call someone. But like, it's not the whole point of going camping is to get away from it. Like, if if I had cell service when I was camping, I'd just sit on my phone the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is kind of nice to be forced <laughs> not to have it. Yeah. In my opinion. If you don't but have my, any power um, to recharge your phone, you won't be on your phone the whole time because then your battery yeah. will be dead. I have like. 10 different charges for my phone that are portable that I would take with me because I have the option. Do you know what I mean? Like my, um, my wife's parents where they live, like you only have reception with one company. Um, and even then if you have reception with them, like it's, it's not the best, like you can maybe make a phone call. So like, I love going to their house because I'm forced to not be on my phone. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't expect to have cell service. So yeah, that, it was funny, like every day, you're like, I'm turning my phone off now to save battery. <laughs> yeah. Well, because like I, I brought extra battery packs, but I was also filming. So I was going through like yeah. battery packs for my cameras and I didn't know how much I was going to be able to charge my phone after I, like the phone was a nice thing to have, but I didn't want to like wear it out. Yeah. That's why I'm so excited to have a camera. I'm yeah, like, just, so you like, have to do I, double duty. Well, yeah, because like, because I record with my phone now. Like, if I record something and don't have my phone plugged in, my phone will go from like a hundred percent to twenty percent in like ten minutes with the app that I use. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. When I got a second battery for my camera, I felt like my world blew open because <laughs> I I, I bought one that. of those straight up. I'm yeah, like, no, it's a good decision. Yeah. I, I have five batteries for my uh, GoPro. Nice, and I still was charging them on the way. GoPros have re- have replaceable batteries. If you get the black editions, oh, I didn't know that. That's I. The whole reason I got the black edition not because of the better frame rates or better anything else. It's because I went. <laughs> I want to have a battery pack that I can just pop in and out. Remember when mobile phones used to? Oh, actually, yours probably still does. Mobile phones used to be able to take the battery out. Ah, uh, yeah, mine doesn't anymore. Like I think my last, yeah. my last Galaxy Samsung phone did, and this one doesn't. Yeah, Black, Blackberries the have five was a long awesome one, dude. time, and I don't have a BlackBerry yeah. anymore. <laughs> I mean, Grant. So, Grant, going back to your point about like solo versus group camping. Um, I mean, one of one thing I love about camping is all the like really great conversation that comes out of it when you're with other people, and that kind of is going back to like going to camp for so many years as a kid, like summer camp. 
Um, I just got so many great relationships to that. Like I've done a, I did a solo, a little solo camping trip once to kind of like cap off a road trip. And I just didn't find it as fun. Like, I don't know. I, 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 I love, this I love my, Survivor Man. Sorry, yeah, guys. this was my first and only time that I've ever done it. You don't. So, so you don't think you're going to do it again? It would have to be for a particular reason. Yeah, to do it again. I see that. That I, I totally get that because I remember when I was doing it. At a certain point, I was just like, it was kind of just like a reason to stay the night. And I, at a certain point, I was just like, I want to go back to see my friends. Like, there's yeah. not like any reason I need to be here any longer. I woke up at four a.m. and just like packed up camp and left. That's exactly what I, would, I did. I left a day I would early. Literally go insane. Yeah, no, you're totally right. You need, I think if you're going solo camping, you really do need a reason to do it, or else you you get a little yeah. caught up in your head. Yeah, because I was literally going, "What am I doing here? What am I trying to prove?" I felt like I was just <laughs> kept replaying Jimmy Deresta saying, "I do these." Like I can't remember how many like percent he said. I think he said like, you know, he does an eighty percent or something. But he's like, I I set my thing. I want to run a mile, and he runs three quarters of a mile and says, "I'm done." Right? Like I don't need to prove myself for the rest of the mile. Like that's exactly <laughs> what I did. I pulled the day early. I went, what What am I gonna do? I'll, instead of staying here for a night, I'll just hike twice as far today as I had planned mm-hmm. on. Right? And I was yeah. like. That's just what I'm going to do. That's the way I'm going to prove it to myself is I'll, I'll do a, a double hike instead of staying at the campsite in the, in between. But uh, that's it, the, the mental aspect of being alone. Like it really gave me a lot of like, I don't know if you guys ever watched the history show alone or seen any of the, the YouTubers that do alone camping. No, but I, I watched a lot of Survivor Man as a kid. Yeah, right. Yeah. Survivor Man's the same he's out there by himself that's exactly what i did except for there were people around because it's a campsite but you know like he, he, i wasn't really alone but like if i wanted to i could have chatted with the other people but i was gonna say like if you're in that situation you probably find a lot of people that camp by themselves will go and join the people that are camping and you no know, a lot of times like, the people um, don't that go there by themselves want to be alone that's why they're yeah, there yeah i'm just not that type of person like no, I, mean, I think what, it's literally one of my favorite things about camping is doing it with other people. Like when I was living in the Rockies this summer, we did a couple overnight trips and just like the camaraderie you get out of that and like all the little conversations and like, I don't know, we had our tent almost blow away and you like you have that experience by yourself and you're like, I could just not tell anyone and <laughs> no one would ever know. But yeah, no, I totally, yeah, I don't think I'll do it again, mm-hmm. I, but I wanted to see if I could, if that makes yeah, sense. For sure. No, it does. It's it's one of those things like you got to think about it. I don't know, but I, I, I couldn't even um, I couldn't even live alone. Better yet, go camping without power alone. <laughs> what, <laughs> like, really nice. The most amount of time you're if you're by yourself though, like you're spending a lot more time doing things that you might be able to split up. Like you might say, "Hey, can you go gather firewood? I'm gonna go get the water." Right. Mm, and instead, yeah. that's I'm gonna spend an hour getting firewood and an hour getting water. Right. Like. That's two hours might, of your day gone, and you haven't done anything. Like, I might tell my wife I'm going camping by myself, and then go stay in a hotel with my new gaming PC and just game all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have done though a solo road trip, and that I feel like is a great thing to do by yourself, especially if you're going between cities. I kind it's... of do that every day. Oh yeah, like just commuting. Like, <laughs> it's an hour and a half to work. I drive there by myself every day. Like, yeah. I guess I'm more talking about like if you're going from like city to city, staying in like a hostel or an Airbnb or a, or a hotel. I go city to like city. Oh, oh my because, god! Oh yeah, because you're on a train. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. no, 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 but, but just but because like when you're when you're going from this place to place, it's inherently easy to meet people. Yeah, um, traveling in that way. Well, new jobs. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I think a bit different though. It's like a road trip. You're you're expected to be within civilization and not expected to be alone. Yeah, yeah. the The mental aspect of it, I I was very surprised at how much it played on me. Yeah, me too. Like I might same thing in my solo camping trip. It's just like I, I think, as, especially if you've been like really entrenched in like other people and society and the internet and everything else, it's just like the lack of stimulation or anyone else. It's just easy to get into these loops in your head. Mm-hmm. I found. 
I, I honestly think I would go insane. Yeah. Like by myself. I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I no, I mean, you, yeah. We uh, crave other people yeah. as humans. Definitely. Like even, um, like, because I, I play um, I play games a lot, like Xbox. Well, not too much anymore, but I used to um, with my mates. And my wife would be like, oh, you're not going to play tonight. Um, well, well, now my mates aren't on, so why would I? Like, I wouldn't play by myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm just not one of those. I, I just can't be alone. I don't know. I don't know what that says about my personality. <laughs> well, I think it's just very natural. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, you know, being connected with other people. I feel like I'm in a people, psychiatry session. No, I think being connected <laughs> with other people is a good thing. And maybe we should tell other people, uh, all the listeners, who we think they should connect with this week. And right. uh, how will we oh, start with you, segue. Morley? All right, I'll start it off. Um so my who I think the viewers should put in their clamps this week is my friend or our friend John Kaipoff. Mm. Uh, so John's a guy I met through the makers on Zoom having coffee, the weekly hangouts, and he's kind of one of the first guys in. And I might have followed him on Instagram before then, but I definitely didn't know much about him. And he is a super interesting guy who makes really good videos that I don't think enough people watch. He has like a little over a thousand subscribers on YouTube. Um, in his words, he's just starting out in his videos, but they're really well done. Um, he does a lot of digital fabrication. He teaches, um, in a digital fabrication lab at the college of New Jersey, um, all sorts of laser cutting and woodworking. He's like a very talented woodworker as well as a background in coding and programming and really just interesting story. Um, a story of which you might hear in another podcast in the next few days, wink, Ooh. wink, nudge, nudge. Um, which one? Yeah. Jo- Take a wild guess. <laughs> because we make. Somehow you got it wrong. Oh, no. No, I, I knew. I was just trying uh, to. Uh, is he going to be on making it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay, cool. They're bringing back the, the first guest since William Osmond. Yeah. Um, no, but he's that's... he's a really he's a really great guy. And um, I, I'm just waiting for him to blow up. Like he, he has, he makes a lot of like videos with really interesting stories that I feel like not, it's not the norm in the maker community. Um, yeah. Very unique. Good dude. Go check him out and yeah. give him some f- subscribers and views. Well, how about you, Adam? What do you got for us? What do you think needs to be in people's clamps this week? So I'm going way out of the box this week. And um, recently, so whenever I've used my thickness art, all the, the wood just never wanted to go through. It was this really, I like, always got bogged down and stuff. And then I thought, you know what? Aren't you supposed to oil like the beds and stuff? So I did that and oh my God, what a game changer. So out of the box, but my clamp mandation this week is to oil your tools. Like it literally will change your life. It, yeah. Um, yeah. Or wax. So, or wax. What, whatever. Oil, wax, wax. Well, just- um, yeah, 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 yeah. Wax your tools. Um, <laughs> Keep your tools tuned up. Um, yeah, the beds. I mean, so yeah. Um, but I also do have an honorable mention um, as well. Did you guys see the video that Adam Savage made of like adding your rickshaw onto the robot dog? Yeah, like the Boston Dynamics one. I didn't see the full yeah. video, but I saw the like drone shot he did. When he was oh, uh, so cool. driving it. Yeah. yeah. So he's got like a robot dog and he put a hitch on it and then put a rickshaw on it and like pulled himself along. Um, yeah. I just think it was really cool. It's a pretty crazy proof of concept because the whole thing yeah. with that Boston Dynamics robot is that it has incredibly lifelike movement and mannerisms. So it, it's like, how would a robot dog respond to actually pulling something? I like, I don't know well, if anyone's yeah. done that before. It was, like the video was really cool. They, um, they like, they took the dog and then they can actually adjust. Like they can tell the dog this much weight's on your back. You need to adjust for it and stuff. And like, so they didn't do anything. They just put it on there and then went and it pulled him along fine. But then as soon as it got a little bit of a hill, it sort of struggled. And then they went into the data and changed it and said this much weight's on here. But then they've got to also adjust for like pulling it as well as the weight down on it and all that sort of stuff. And then like it pulled it heaps better. But it, yeah, great concept of what that dog could actually be used for. 
<laughs> pulling a rickshaw. <laughs> yeah, well, no, yeah, but you cars. think like you know you see like all those. Oh, well, I don't know if it's actually the, a real thing, but like it, on TV you see like the horse and carriages around the American. Yeah, I don't know how open the Amish community would be to using a robot to pull their carriages, though. No, no, but like, but how long before like people start using that for Uber and stuff? Like, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, maybe not on the roads, but through the parks and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, well, they're already doing some like, um, some like drone food delivery and things. Yeah, go to Disneyland. There's just like twenty thousand rickshaws getting pulled along by robot dogs. That's actually probably where it would happen first. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, on to Grant. <laughs> so my plant mendation this week is going to be, because uh, we talked a lot about canoeing and building a cedar strip canoe um, and uh, and that kind of like camping and stuff like that. And I'm going to recommend, it's not a cedar strip canoe video, but it's a, it's a guy who's <laughs> made one uh, and he's from my hometown here in Ottawa. Uh, Andrew Zito. I've talked about him before, but he put out a uh, recycled skateboard uh, and epoxy baseball bat. Um, he puts out one every year. It's a different design. Uh, his name is, uh, you spell it S Z E T O. Um, and uh, he's actually been mentioned on making it before and stuff, but, uh, you know, because he's that cool. But he built it like an A frame <laughs> cabin. But he's got a time lapse of him making a cedar strip canoe that I thought Morley might like. But I really cool. like this uh, his little like baseball bats that he's been making every year, and I and I thought that was a really cool kind of thing that I think people might enjoy. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll check him out. And another honorable mention, but he doesn't need it. Someone else that made a cedar strip canoe. Jimmy Dresta. Jimmy Dresta. Yeah. Nick, like another Nick, one? Nick Offerman, too. He made one. Yeah. Or two. <laughs> They're very popular. Yeah. Well, the, the one thing I'm, I feel like I would be a little worried with a cedar canoe is like, I mean, we were scraping the rocks a lot during this trip, like going down rapids and just pulling up on shore. And I would, I don't know, how durable are the bottom of those canoes? Well, are you a woodworker? Uh, I don't know if I'd call myself a woodworker. Could, could, do you work with, if you built one of those, I think you could. And then I think you could also repair them. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. But they have like, they're like, like anything, you really shouldn't be scraping on the rocks through a rapid uh, in yeah. your canoe because you might have just sank your aluminum canoe. But uh, it, yeah, it, it always, <laughs> yeah, it always sounds way worse in a canoe than it actually is. Like scraping yeah, up resonates. on the, yeah, it resonates a lot. Like the, I don't know why, but. Like the acoustics inside of a canoe just make it sound way worse when you're pulling it up on shore. You're just like, oh my God, the bottom of this canoe must be destroyed. And then you get in. It's not. Yeah. Do you know, this is going to be like the dumbest thing I've ever said, especially on this podcast. But for some reason in my head, the fact of making a boat out of wood just sounds like the bad idea. <laughs> well, but like, I mean, compared it, to that's plastics. how they started. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like the first ever boat would have been well, made out of wood. But just the thought of putting wood in water just sounds so weird. I mean, honestly, putting um, a boat in salt water, as- assuming you want to keep it finished nicely, is a terrible idea. Like I hmm. – the people who have wooden boats in salt water spend so much time and money refinishing them like year after year after year. Um, it yeah. just – it never lasts. I feel like if I had a, a wooden boat in the salt water, I just wanted to go rustic. Um. And I don't know, maybe you can't do that, but I feel like at least if it's a canoe and it's in a lake, it's going to last a little longer. Yeah. And they don't spend a lot of, like the biggest thing is actually getting them out of the sunlight. The sunlight's way worse than the water because they don't Mm. spend a lot of time in the water compared to sitting around. Yeah. I guess if you have a wooden sailboat on a mooring, it's, it's really going to be in the sun and water for a long time. Yeah. But you also wouldn't just put it in raw wood. You'd finish it in something, right? Yeah. 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 For sure. Well, I guess so. Everyone should check out those people. Um, normally at this point, we'd be reading reviews, but we don't have any reviews this week. So don't forget to go on iTunes or uh, Podcast Addict are the two main places we've gotten reviews. Uh, or you can just send them straight to our Instagram at Clampcast. Uh, if you don't want to like actually leave a real review. 
and just want to send it to us directly, that's cool too. Uh, we'll read it here. Um, yeah. Um, then where can everyone find you? That's our next part of our, uh, oh God, well, I, I hate ending. I'm really good <laughs> at segues, and I suck at ending. Before the uh, outro, I, I, just, I just want to quickly say yeah. something. Um, so a while ago, I talked about dados and said they were illegal in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out I did some research and they're not. They're actually quite very legal in Australia. Yeah. Um, I had, I did actually have someone message me after I'd already done the research and said that um, dados are legal. Do you know um, why you thought they were illegal? I guess because I just never heard of them. Hmm. Like, I, I, as far as I mean, I'm not a cabinet maker. I've never been in that industry, although I tried when I was younger. Um, I just don't think I've ever seen them. Like I've never seen them in the shop or anything like that. There are um, apparently, if you go, there's a place here called Carbotech, which I think is global, but they have like a showroom where they would actually sell them, but they wouldn't sell them at like Bunnings or something. Gotcha. So I get. I guess I just being that I'd never seen them in my life in person, I just assumed. Which was wrong with me, but yeah. I, in your defense, I think I had, I've heard people say that they are illegal in some places. Well, they're illegal. I know they are in some. Yeah, they're oh. illegal in Europe. I know that. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Hey, they're not like they're not illegal, but they're very, very, very difficult to obtain. It's like yeah, you Christina can, uh, from Get Her Hands Dirty has one. Yeah. And it's the same with like sauce tops aren't available in Europe. But Laura Kampf has one, so mm. <laughs> yeah, I think they're hard. I think they're hard to get. What well, Laura Kampf probably got hers through store stop. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, but it's still globalization, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Well, okay. So that was the any other business part that I completely forgot to cover. <laughs> but uh, what I will say that uh, don't forget to sign up on Patreon um, and get the after show, which we're going to be recording after this show. Uh, but until then, where can everyone find you, Morley? You can find me at Morley Kurt everywhere. And how about you, Adam? You can find me at Make a Mackey everywhere, including makeamackey.com. Ah, and uh, you guys can all find me at The Grand Alexander, wherever it counts. And that means it's not Twitter. Um, and you can find us collectively at The Clampcast on Instagram or at. Uh, buzzsprout uh, clamp.buzzsprout.com uh, <laughs> that's where you can find the podcast and yeah. uh, bye 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 <laughs>